All right. Well, hey, welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. Looks like we're going to have a pretty exciting time together. We have a nice big crowd joining us here today. want to thank you so much for your time. Um, we have a really, really cool 60 minutes ahead of us with the amazing Mike uh, Michalowicz and uh, Cindy Thomason, who will be unpacking today's webinar, which is about how to achieve permanent profitability within the next 24 hours. So before we get started, my name is Will Lopez, and uh, I have some housekeeping rules for you. So of course, thank you so much for joining us. Great stuff going on today. We are live on Zoom, so hang in there if something happens. You know, in this virtual world, virtual things happen and sometimes takes us down. But if you have any questions throughout today's event or webinar, please leave them in the comments. Don't hold on to them. Just let them go. As you kind of hear the content, as you hear Michael and, and uh, Cindy talk today, that way it'll give me time to like get those questions uh, ready for Michael and, um, and Cindy to tackle. During Q&A, of course, we'll give it our best effort to answer every single question, but chances are if there's a lot of questions, not all will be answered, but good news is look for more resources uh, in the description and that we'll be sharing throughout today's event. I'm Will Lopez, head of Gusto's accountant community, been at Gusto for about 18 months, been public accounting my entire career, here to help support the accounting profession and small business owners that work with accountants like myself. Uh, also with me is Cindy Thomason. She's the president of Bookskeep, an e-commerce accounting firm, uh, doing great work, and she'll be leading today's session as well, along with uh, Mike Michalowicz. He's the author, welcome him, author of Profit First. It's great to, to have him on board. You're going to learn a lot. And so what I'll do here is cover the things that we'll be touching on today. Uh, first thing we'll kind of cover in the agenda is like why entrepreneurs need a profit system that works with their behavior. Secondly, we'll try to tackle a little bit of uh, how to set up profit first in your business for yourself. Uh, why Parkinson's uh, law is the key to becoming pr uh, permanently profitable and then advanced profit first tips and case studies. Uh, lastly, we'll end with Q and A. So without further ado, I'm actually going to turn off the screen and let Mike take us away. Mike, thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Oh, Will, it's a joy to be here with you. Let me just uh, zoom in my camera a little bit. Thank you to Gusto for uh, hosting us. I hope you saw my little sign back there, my shout out where <laughs> Gusto uses ourselves. Love, love your system. And uh, just thank you for every entrepreneur that's here. I want to start with this. The world is starving for your success. In fact, your clients are dying for you to be profitable. They want it for you in the worst way. Now, listen, the clients will never come to you and say, hey, uh, could you charge me more? Could you, could you double the rates? But I will tell you this, your clients want your undivided attention. They want the best of you. They want to be seen and felt like they are the most important person in the world to you when you are caring for them, when you are serving them. And the only way you can do that is through profitability. You must have profitability because if you're worrying about getting that next customer in the door because you're barely getting by, you can't serve your clients extraordinarily well. You can't focus on them. So you have a responsibility to be profitable. It's the best way to be of service to our clients. Now, as I was studying profitability, I came across a uh, statistic that kind of blew my mind. U.S. Bank conducted a study a couple of years back. They actually freshen and update it every so often identified in the U.S., it became actually a national, international study, but in the U.S., that 83% of small businesses are surviving check by check. I'm going to activate my, my uh, chat so I can just see you guys too. But I'm curious, is your business a small business? Let me tell you how the SBA defines it. In this study, they said that companies that do $25 million in annual revenue or less are small business. That's my business. Can, can you write this? Are you a small business that survives check by check? Post that in the chat. And uh, in the chat, make sure you choose all panelists and attendees. I'd love to see what your experience is. Um, in my business for years, so I see Lee is saying, yes, check by check. Peter is there. Yes, uh, but definitely almost all of it. Ashley, yep. So lots of yeses. Yeah, Pete, Ch Chad, Liz, I'm with you. Um, Curtis, certain times of the year. Um, yeah, so for a lot of businesses, we survive check by check. Other businesses, there's a seasonality to it. The wonderful thing is uh, we're going to address that. I'm going to give you the basic principles. Cindy is going to share with you very specific strategies on how you can manage seasonality or when you sometimes dip into struggles and dip uh, back into uh, some form of profitability. 
Well, what I found is the reason so many businesses survive check by check that we need sales today to support payroll next week. Maybe you can relate to this one too. If I don't have enough money in the bank, um, you know, it's rent, it's my employees, but the last person to get paid is the owner. That's the struggle of most businesses. But why is it? Um, let me ask you this and, and put this one in the chat too. You can say both or, or name the one. I want to know the reasons that you own and operate a business. Do you do it? Did you start it for personal freedom? Do what you want. And did you do it for financial freedom that you didn't have to worry about bills anymore? If, if you did for both reasons, put both. If you did for personal freedom or financial, put that. Uh, I'm seeing Liz both, Rachel both, both from Derek, Chadley. I see, yeah, freedom and passion, right? Both. Uh, I, I wanted to make more money. <laughs> Courtney, you nailed it, right? Yeah, mission serving both. Yeah, good, because you represent what most entrepreneurs do. We start a business because we're passionate about what we're doing. We want to serve our community. We want to do what we feel called to do. And we want to have financial viability to do it. Uh, and, and perhaps to live other elements of our life. Yet with that reason for running a business, uh, financial viability, uh, financial freedom, with those reasons for starting a business, the vast majority of business owners don't achieve it. That's what confused me. If that's why we're doing this, how come so few people actually achieve it? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with us? What's missing in our brain, I thought? How come we can't achieve goal number one or one of the top two goals? How come we're not achieving it? And that's when I came across something that's flawed in the most foundational formula we're taught. And I'll share with you. I'm not a big uh, PowerPoint user. I'm a massive paper point user. And uh, here's the formula. And you know this inherently. We are told sales minus expenses that you incur in your business results in profit. This is the foundational formula that we've all been told. And it makes absolute logical sense. We incur sales. We must draw and bring in money. We uh, subtract the expenses we incur to sustain our business and what's left over is profit. This makes logical sense. But the problem is it does not make what's called behavioral sense because it's human nature. When something comes last, that means it's insignificant. If you love your family, I suspect you say over saying, I, I suspect you say, I, lo I put, love my family so much, I put them first. I suspect you don't say, I love my family so much, I put them last. You know, what comes first is a priority. If you were concerned about your health, do you say, I put my health first? Of course, you wouldn't say, I love to be healthier. That's why I'm putting my health last. No, of course not. It is human nature. What comes first gets done and what comes last gets delayed. It's the perpetual manana syndrome. What we've been told, and this is in thousands of accounting books, is it is even in our vernacular, we call profit the bottom line, the year end. It all says, Profit is a final consideration. And actually, as we're doing this, the timing's perfect. It's tax season, right? We're approaching April 15th here in the US. And this is when our accountants do the year ends. Maybe you already have yours. Now, I remember my accountant coming to me year after year. And the very bottom was a negative number. Or worse, I remember the one occasion he circled $15,000. Keith, my accountant, patted me on the back and said, Mike, I want to congratulate you. You've been struggling real hard in your business. You've been pushing so much. But uh, you have a $15,000 profit. And I felt great until I asked him the question. I said, Hey, Keith, uh, where is that profit? <laughs> you know, you're asked that question and the accountant starts laughing and you know how accountants do this. They laugh and it reverts to maniacal snorting. Keith looks at me and he goes, 50,000. 50, <laughs> he goes, you don't have that money. That's an accounting profit. <laughs> what we're going to talk about today is not the accounting definition of profit, not what they show in your income statement or your other documents. We're going to talk about cold, hard cash in your bank. Cindy and I commit to doing that for you today. We're going to drive cold, hard cash into your pocket. And here's how you do it. We're simply going to flip the formula. The new formula is this. Sales minus profit equals expenses. What we did here is a variable swap. We took sales, this is the old formula. We moved expenses down and we moved profit up. In 
Practice, every time you have sales come into your business starting today, take a predetermined percentage of that money as profit, hide it away from your business, remove it from your business, and what's left over is what you've available to operate your business. This is the core principle of profit first. Pay yourself first, apply it to business. Now, how do we do this? Well, I'm gonna show you at hyperspeed the basic way of doing this. Thank God I'm from New Jersey and I speak this quickly because that's the only way we're going to get through this quickly enough. How, I'm going to ask you two questions and I really uh, would love for you to participate in the chat actively because we can do a little survey here. Uh, question number one I have for you is, um, do you have what's called a primary checking account for your business? And what I mean by this is you have a checking account where most of your deposits or all your deposits go and most of your bills or all your bills get paid from. Do you have that? Just post in the chat, yes or no. Do you have a primary checking account? So I'm seeing a lot of yeses. This is excellent. You're saying yes. I got great news for you. Yes, yes, yes. I did it with Patricia before profit first. Yes, yes. Okay. I love that you're saying yes because I've had the privilege of surveying uh, potentially now hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs over the years of teaching profit first. Most businesses have a primary checking account. If you said yes, you are staged to be very profitable. And for those of you who have implemented Profit First, you know how you can take that and make it your friend because we're going to expand on it. Now, I have another question for you. How often do you check your bank account? Put that in. Honestly, like how often do you log into your bank account? Do you check once a month, uh, once a week? How often do you log in and see if you have money? My, the system I use is I checking, honestly, multiple times a day. I see once a week, weekly, daily daily or more. So, someone I think just said checking right now, <laughs> um, four times a week, a couple times a week. Awesome. Now, here's the interesting thing. My account told me, Mike, stop logging to your bank account because it doesn't reflect the health of your business. Instead, read your income statement, tie that to the balance sheet and the cash flow statement. Read those documents, run key metrics, the operating cash ratio, the inventory turn, know all these things, and you know the true health of your business. Bank account is not reflective of where your business stands. He goes, it's the worst thing to look at. But what I did was the entrepreneurial shortcut. My behavior was to log into the bank account, see if I had money. I had money. I knew I could spend it. I didn't. Panic would often ensue, and I would try to sell something to somebody real quickly. The natural behavior, and you demonstrated it here, for most entrepreneurs is we go to that primary checking account that you have, and we check it a lot to see if we have money or not. The fact that you do that is awesome because you're demonstrating the natural behavior of entrepreneurs. Perhaps one of the biggest lessons I want you to take away from my segment here is don't change who you are. That is hard. Intercept who you are. Intercept your behavioral patterns, what you do, and set up a system that channels it to the outcome you want. I'll give you a quick example. I wanted to start exercising regularly. My entire life, I knew the value of it, and I would exercise haphazardly. Sometimes I'd work out, sometimes I wouldn't. Seven years ago, I changed that. I don't miss a single workout, including today. And what I did was I observed my behavior. And maybe you can use this tip too if you want to start exercising consistently. I noticed when I'd wake up in the morning, I'd go to the bathroom, and I'd go get a cup of coffee. I'd start sipping my coffee, looking at the news, thinking, oh, I got to work out, but read some more news. And then, oh my gosh, the day's getting away from me. I need to go to work. And I'd miss my workout. But I looked at my behavioral pattern. Where did I go first? Was to the bathroom. So what I started doing is I put my sneakers on top of my toilet seat. The only way I can wake up and use the bathroom is by grabbing my sneakers now. And once the sneakers are in my hand, I'm like, just put my feet. And now I've started that positive momentum to go to the gym. And I do every time. With Profit First, you shared your natural pattern is to go to your bank account. And I'm telling you, that's the best behavior. If we set the system at your bank account, we can put those sneakers on the toilet seat. We can intercept the behavior. What we need to do is at your bank account, set up multiple accounts to pre-allocate money to its intended use before we spend it. Money arrives at your bank, we carve it up. And then when you log into your bank account, like you already do, now you see what money can be used for what purpose. It's the envelope system applied to our business. Here's how it works. Uh, in, with your primary checking account, we're going to rename that to the income account. It's going to be a depository only account, meaning deposits go in just like they already are, and money is going to stay there. We're then going to carve it up into these remaining 
four foundational accounts. When Cindy presents, she's going to share, you can actually expand the profit first system to serve you in so many unique ways. I just want to give you the basics. The five accounts in cumulative are the income account we just talked about. Next account is called the profit account. We'll talk about that in a second. The one after that is called owner comp. Next one is called tax. The last one is called OPEX. These are accounts at your bank. And this is how it works starting today. When money comes into your business at your bank, the deposit is going to an income account. We then are going to allocate money from the income account based upon predetermined percentages to these other accounts in this order. So money comes in the income account. We're then going to allocate money toward profit. A portion of this income is profit. If you want to have a company that does, let's say, 10% profit, that's your intention, then as income comes in, we're going to take 10% of it. Now you've assured your 10% profit. Say you want to pay yourself a salary and say your business makes 200,000 a year. I don't know what your business makes, of course. I'm just picking a random number. You make 200,000 a year and you want to take home, say, uh, $100,000. That'd be 50%. It's a nice salary, right? You're going to have tax liabilities. And then you're going to have money left to run your business. So five, six, seven. Um, I think I did this right. Let me see. Five, six, seven. Yeah. So these percentages I'm showing you are just as an example. Um, do not, these do not necessarily apply to your business, but there's a way to achieve what I call the fiscally elite percentages. My company conducted a study of over a thousand businesses, industry agnostic, and we saw what the best of the best do in every category, what the best accounting firms uh, achieve as profitability, the best booking firms, the best law firms, the best retail shops, the best manufacturers, the best everything. And we found percentages. They are in the profit first book. Um, but as an example, if money comes in today and say I have a thousand dollar deposit that comes in today, 10% I'm going to allocate into the profit account. So I'm going to put a hundred dollars in there. I'm going to put five hundred dollars away to pay the owner. I'm going to reserve $150 to pay taxes, and $250 is left to operate the business. Now, this is the shocker moment. Let me explain what each account is. Income is the deposit only account. It shows you how much money is flowing into your business on a cash flow basis. Profit is a reward for running the business. Your clients want you to be profitable. And I also want you to realize as a owner of the business, you've taken the risk that so few people do. Only 7% of the global population ever runs a business or operates a business. So if that represents you, you're one of the few. 93% of the folks are looking for a good job. They're looking to work for reliable companies. Profit is a reward for shareholders. You're a shareholder in your business, if you own the business, is a thank you for supporting our economy, for taking on that risk. That's a bonus. Owner's comp is the compensation to pay you your salary. If you had to replace yourself, what would you pay for the new you? This is the salary you get. So owner's compensation is to support your lifestyle. Profit is a bonus for starting a business and running an operating business. Taxes, you know, the number one bill associated with the operation of a business that business owners are generally least prepared for? It's a tax bill. Your business is going to pay your taxes on your behalf. Now, we can go into the particulars. We don't really have time for that, but this works for an LLC, an LLP, S Corp, C Corp, hybrid, sole proprietorships. Your business can always pay your taxes. And you have to do it properly. Sometimes it's through what's called a reimbursement to the owner. That's an S Corp and C Corp. Other times through a tax distribution to the government. That's LLCs, LLPs, and stuff like that. And the last account here, it's the heart attack moment, is the OPEX. This is how much money is truly available to operate your business. You see, when you take your profit first, the profit you want, when you pay yourself the way you deserve to be paid, when you don't want to worry about taxes and you shouldn't, this is what you must do. This is a very simple method for reverse engineering what your business truly is available. But before, when we only had that one account, I saw $1,000 pop in my account. I'm like, hey, I have $1,000 to spend. I can get that new computer we needed to get or whatever. But now I see what's truly available to run a healthy business. And this is where I have to work. These are the confines I have to work within. When I say I have $250 for operating expenses, it invokes what's called Parkinson's law. And uh, as Will was sharing, perhaps this is one of the most important things I can share with you. Parkinson was a theorist in the 1950s studying human behavior and found an interesting phenomenon about how we behave. We're not logical. Surprise, surprise. We're behavioral. But he identified that as a resource expands its availability, we consume more of it. The more time you're given to do something, 
chances are, according to Parkinson, it takes you longer to do it. Have, if you if you and I were negotiating a contract and I say, I'll get you the agreement in two weeks, it'll likely take me two weeks. But if you and I, the same people, have the same conversation about the same parameters for the same contract, but I say, I'll get to you in one day, I'll likely get to you in one day. As I compress the resource of time, I become more efficient. Have you noticed when you're under a crunch that you move faster? Parkinson's law. And have you noticed in your life, when you've had less money, you found a way to get by? Parkinson's law. And that's why this system works. As we constrain the amount of money available to operate our business, we start realizing what bills we truly can and should afford, and which ones we shouldn't. We start becoming frugal. It's called forced frugality. But also, and perhaps more excitedly, we become innovative. When there's less money, we have to find ways to get results. I suspect the early, early days of your business, right when you started out and you had less money than you did flowing into your business today, I bet you found miraculous ways to get things done. You make a desk out of a door. You, you know, you borrow or, or you know, some, some companies getting rid of computers and, and you get free computers. I suspect you found ways because frugality and innovation was forced upon you. But as our business grows, have you ever noticed this? That as your income in your business is hopefully growing over time, have you noticed that expenses uncannily grow over time? That's not a, you know, that's not some greater force going on. That's Parkinson's law. More resource, more money flow, more we spend. What Profit First does is it forces this gap. As money flows in, we take out the components we want, profit, pay, reserve for taxes, and then the business tells us what's truly available. We automatically adjust due to Parkinson's law. So these are five accounts we set up our bank. I want to share one more core principle before I throw it over to Cindy, and I want to ask something too. Um, this, these five accounts I showed you is for bank one. Whatever bank you work with today, if you have a great experience with them, I strongly suggest you keep working with them. Um, and what we do have to also do is find a second bank. I'm going to call it bank two. Bank two, we're going to set up two accounts, profit hold and tax hold. These are accounts we set up at our second bank. And what we do is we're going to transfer money from our primary bank to our second bank to hide money from ourselves. It's so easy to steal from ourselves. It's because we are very weak when it comes, humans, when it comes to temptation. My, one of my biggest temptations is chocolate chip cookies. I'm addicted to them. And someone who's as hyper as me really shouldn't have any more sugar. <laughs> but my daughter loves to make chocolate chip cookies and my family loves chocolate chip cookies. But the only way I found for me not to eat them is to remove them from the house. So my daughter is kind enough not to make chocolate chip cookies at home anymore, or not much at least. And we don't buy them. They're not there. What I used to do was if there was a chocolate chip cookie laying out, like, oh, I really shouldn't. I'm trying to stop. I'm a little sniff never hurt anyone. Let me eat all of them. But when they're removed, when you remove temptation, you don't become tempted. When money's piling up in the profit account and we don't see enough money to pay our bills, it's very tempting to say, oh, I can just borrow from my profit account, unwinding the system. The reality is if we hide the profit and there's not enough money to pay our bills, we say, oh, I have to adjust the way I operate my business. The only way to afford this now is to cut unnecessary cost. There'll be some of that. The bigger opportunity, increase margin. How do I dictate a better premium for what I'm doing so I can afford the proper operations? In fact, I'm so happy to say, Cindy and I, we have over 500,000 implementations of Profit First globally. It's been that widely accepted. And every day, there's hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of more businesses implementing Profit First. I, I hope you're going to join the, the movement. What we found is these businesses, when they can't pay their bills, the biggest opportunity is increasing margins. They find out they were never billing correctly in the first place. They were underpricing themselves. Maybe you fall in that category. When you can't pay your bills with the system, your business is telling you there's a reason you can't afford your bills. Raise your prices and reduce and remove unnecessary expenses that are not benefiting you. Hide away the profit. We also hide away the tax. The reason we hide away the taxes is because the money sits there, it's for the government's use, but it's very tempting to use this. So we remove it away. What we're gonna do is this money accumulates in your profit account. Every quarter, we're gonna do a profit distribution. Just like the big boys, if you own any public stock, I own some Ford stock, 
Every quarter, they send me a profit distribution. You're gonna start doing the same thing for your business. And it's a sad state of affairs. Very few businesses have any profit at the end of the year, right around now, as we do tax returns. And almost no businesses, except for 500,000 now, are doing quarterly profit distributions. And you need to do the same. It's a reward mechanism. It's your business reminding you of the extraordinary value you provide for our economy. You are providing jobs. And if they're not jobs because of employees directly and you're a sole proprietor, you still have vendors and contractors that you're working with. You're probably buying something from someone that is providing jobs for other businesses. You're serving customers. Profit is a thank you. Now, listen, we're, in a minute, we're going to transfer to, to Cindy. I just, I just fear moving this fast. In a, I usually teach profit first over four hours. The stuff I just taught you, we did it in 23 minutes. We move so fast that I fear that you may be purely overwhelmed, and that's normal. And you might even be skeptical. What I challenge you to do is to start slow and let it grow. There's one thing you can do starting today that will start serving you. And just set one account. With the COVID pandemic, you probably can do it online with your bank or call them up and they'll send you the papers via email. But set one account and call it profit at your bank. So keep that primary checking account, add a profit account and start allocating only 1% of any income that comes in. Because 1% is a negligible amount. If a $1,000 deposit comes in, what I'm saying starting today and only do this, Allocate that 1%, that's $10, to your profit account and let $990 stay in your primary checking so you can run your business like you always have. It won't affect the operations of your business. The difference between $1,000 and $990 is basically nothing. But what's extraordinarily impactful is that starting today, you'll have a $10 profit. And tomorrow, now it's going to be $20. At a certain point, you're going to move that 1% for profit to two or three. And then you're going to start seeing the profit accumulating. And I think by seeing that, You'll prove to yourself, sure enough, you can take your profit first, and then you'll start implementing the entire system. Cindy, before I throw it over to you, I, I do want to ask our community one thing that I think will serve you. Thank you for attending this Gusto event, but also it selfishly will serve me and Cindy. Uh, my book that we're talking about is called Profit First. And Cindy, could you throw up your book on the screen too? Cindy wrote the adjunct to this, Profit First for e-commerce. If you're an e-commerce business or you do any version of e-commerce like I do, I have a shopping cart, I use PayPal. These two books together will serve you in implementing Profit First properly. Here's our ask. Right now, as we're doing this live, if you're willing to go on Amazon and get a copy of Profit First and a copy of Profit First for e-commerce, just search those names. I'll put in the links too. If you're willing to get it, I promise you, this is the greatest way we can serve you. For the price point is all my knowledge and all Cindy's knowledge. But secondly, and this is very selfish of us, they'll also serve us. You see, right now, Cindy and I are on a mission to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. It's actually even on my wall. I believe it so much. And if you buy it right now, it triggers the Amazon system. When a group of people buy something simultaneously on Amazon, it starts promoting it to other entrepreneurs. So it's the greatest way for other entrepreneurs to notice and find the book. And that's why it's selfish. It will serve us. If you get it, Please post in the chat. I want to I wanna thank you for doing that. All right. Oh, oh my God, I already see so many people getting it right now. Ashley, thank you so much. I'll share the links too. Aiden, thank you. Lee, thank you. Everyone that's doing it. Um, some folks already have it. If I may be so bold, if you're willing to get a copy, another copy is a gift of both books for a friend or an employee or someone that would also serve us. I know that's bold to ask, but thank you. All right, Will, I want to throw it over to Cindy. All right, Cindy, before you go ahead, I just want to surface some of the amazing comments from just Mike, from your inspiration and, and passion. I mean, from Chad to Aiden to Patricia saying, you know, passion and freedom and personal freedom is what they're looking for. All the way to Devoy, who says, yeah, we went to a four-day work week and Parkinson's law became so evident. So, you know, keep, continue to comment, continue to ask those questions. Even Pete, who said he found some money in his profit hold account, it was to pay down some debt. It was like magic. Mm -hmm. So continue to surface those comments. We'd love to hear them and uh, continue uh, dropping in your questions. We'll get to them at the end. Okay, well, I want to talk about two different uh, scenarios for um, different types of businesses. So if you could put in the chat, um, if you are a service-based business or if you are a product-based business, I'd kind of like to get a feeling for, for who we have here. So service or product. I'm going to give case studies for both of them. It looks like we've got people that are both and a lot of service providers. So I'm going to start with service providers. 
Uh, I'm a service provider myself. I've got an accounting business and um, my biggest expense is payroll. And if you are one of those people who, when you saw Mike's um, uh, way of allocating funds, you you were like gasping at, oh my God, I've got to operate my business that way. I totally get it because I've been there too. Um, what what we do with our clients is we offer them a chance to take like a, a beach entry into profit first instead of diving over a cliff. When you dive over a cliff and you say you're going to um, have this whole radically new way of behaving and it has such a huge impact in your um, cash flow, you're not going to be able to stay to sustain it. So we want you just to kind of go slow, wade into the water a little bit and start with that one account like Mike recommended with a profit account. But what we find with clients that have service based businesses is that they need a little bit more than that. Because one of the biggest expenses that we have as service providing uh, firms is that we have to figure out how to make our payroll. And um, we all love gusto for, for making it easy for us, but the reality is we have to know that the money is there when gusto goes to draw on our account. So I recommend when you take this kind of a beach entry approach, in addition to that income account, an operating expense account and a profit account, we recommend that you have a payroll account because that's really the, the engine that makes your business work. You need to have uh, assurance that you're going to be able to pay your employees to be able to continue the operations of the business. So I wrote mine out because I'm not good on the fly like Mike, but here's, here's what you're going to want. You're going to want an income account where all of the funds come into your business, into this one serving tray type of account. Then you're going to allocate to your payroll. That ensures that the money that comes in however the percentage is for your business that you set aside funds to make sure you cover your payroll. Then you take your profit, start with 1% like Mike suggested, and then the rest goes to OPEX. Now, if you will use something like this kind of a flow for the money that comes into your account, you're going to see over just a very short amount of time, you're going to breathe a little bit easier. You're going to start to realize that, um, I'm not worrying about making payroll tomorrow because I've put the money aside already. The, the problem when you have something like payroll that hits intermittently and then OPEX that is being used throughout the month is you're always um, able to consider that I'll worry about that tomorrow. And then in two weeks when payroll is due, you've spent that money on something else and the revenue didn't come in like you liked. So when in my business, when the revenue comes in, we immediately move the payroll for the month to our payroll account. And then the rest of the money, we allocate to the accounts like Mike suggested so that, um, so that we do continue to put pressure on operating expenses, but we know that our payroll is taken care of. Now, I, I wanna give you a case study for a uh, client that, um, before I specialized in e-commerce, I, I was an open accounting firm, worked for a no, number of different clients and still have some legacy, still have some legacy clients. This one service um, business that we've worked with for since 2014 had revenue in 2014 of under $50,000, 47,000 to be exact. Their owner pay and profit in 2014 was 14,000. In 2020, they were at a revenue of a million dollars and their owner pay and profit was $250,000. So, and I, I did see one of the questions in the chat earlier about not borrowing money. This, this company never borrowed money. This company always relied on their profit account and money that they were setting aside to reinvest in the business. Um, and one of the neat things that they did, and we get this question a lot, whether it's uh, service businesses or e-commerce businesses, people want to know, how do I know when I can afford to hire someone? Well, this payroll account is your friend for that. Because what you can do is if you're expecting, if your business is growing and you're expecting you're going to need to hire someone, you can up your percentage a little bit more than whatever your your payroll needs are to start to grow the payroll dollars in that bank account. 
when you can see that you can sustain the salary of another person, then you're ready to hire. And it, it just makes it very black and white. The money is there, you can afford it. And what's really cool is you have started to build up that bank account so that when you do bring that person on and they're not like super productive for the first month or two, then you've got those funds to help pay for them when they're on your payroll and they're not really a producer for you. So you can use that payroll account a couple of different ways. You can use it for your existing folks and then you can also use it for your um, planning to bring new people into your business. We do this at our business and I can always tell, I, I watch my percentages really closely and I can always tell when our capacity is starting to get full, then we should be having a balance in that payroll account that we're not using and we can start to evaluate that it's time to make a new hire. Okay, that's the service uh, side of the business. I'm happy to take questions when we get there, but I also want to cover for you the um, product-based businesses. Now, product-based businesses, which is what we deal with in our accounting business the most for e-com clients or for the most part um, have products that they have to manage their inventory and they have to reorder periodically. So we're just gonna switch out this one account. This uh, inventory account is gonna replace that payroll account. Now, if you have both, I saw somebody in our chat say that they had both, you might want an inventory and a payroll account. For our clients that we work with over time, we start adding um, many accounts over time, depending on what they're wanting to manage. But I recommend you at a minimum start with an inventory account in addition to your profit account like Mike suggested. And then everything else can go to OPEX. Again, what we're wanting you to do is take a, uh, a walk into the beach and not dive in uh, head first and get yourself um, in over your head. Because what happens is if you try to do too much too soon, you end up just moving your money around and you say, this doesn't really work. So you wanna go in kind of slow. It's not like flipping a switch, it's like having a dimmer switch. And the clients that we've had the most success with have been working it methodically. Sometimes it takes us 18 months to get to those ideal percentages like Mike recommends, but we've not tried something, gone too aggressive and then had to back off. So I, I really recommend that you do take it a little slow as you get into, um, into this process so you can see some success from it and not just totally shock the cash flow in your business. Now, for the inventory piece, here's how I recommend you do that. So if you have sales from like Amazon or Shopify, um, Etsy, eBay, you know, any of the platforms, Walmart, let those funds accumulate in your uh, income account. And every two weeks, you're going to allocate a percentage to income and then the other two categories, uh, profit and um, OPEX. So to determine what you want to move over into inventory, I recommend you look at what your cost of goods sold is for the period that you just had the sales for. So if you get in um, $10,000 in uh, an Amazon settlement, look at the products that you sold and determine what the cost of those products were. Because at some interval, you're going to have to turn around and replace those products with Amazon. And you want to have the money sitting in your bank account so that you can uh, place that order with your supplier. And what tends to happen is that the Amazon, I'm just going to use them, they pay out every couple of weeks typically. And your inventory ordering is going to be real erratic. Um, I know as our clients start to build up for Q4, for example, um, they're, they're spending a lot of money on inventory and they're not quite ready to, to send that money out the door. So that, that money starts to look big in their accounts. If it's all in OPEX, then what happens is we just start using it. Um, and then we're sitting here needing to place our orders for Q4 and the money's not there. So if you put it in an inventory account, then you're sitting, you, you can look at it and go, I can't touch that. That's what I'm going to use for my Q4. I got to leave it alone. And um, it just helps to separate it out. It, I, I think about it like if you have a big pot of soup and the big pot of soup has all kinds of vegetables in it, we call it vegetable soup. 
but we, it's really hard to know how many carrots are in it or how many potatoes are in it. You can't just look at your soup and know. So by separating it out, you can put your carrots in one pot and your potatoes in another pot and you know specifically what they're gonna be used for. It's really hard when you start mixing everything together. The other challenge with inventory is that its cash flow is not regular in the same way that your operating expenses are. If you pay rent, if you pay insurance, if you pay uh, your virtual assistants, those kinds of expenses happen on a, a very predictable month by month basis. Your inventory is going to vary over time. And um, most e-commerce businesses also have some seasonality to them. And I'm going to talk about that next. But I want you to be aware that um, it's really hard to look at one bank account and understand the rhythm of cash flowing through your inventory account versus your operating expense account. Just by dividing those two bank accounts, you're going to get a better sense of how cash flows through your business. So create that separate inventory account. If you do nothing else, it will, it will shine a light on cash flow. And most of the time, what we see is clients using that inventory account to float their operating expenses. And when they start doing that, that means they're living beyond their means and then they're going to have to use debt to get out of that situation. So be really careful with your inventory. It's got a whole different flow. Now I want to share you share with you some numbers with a um, client that is a e-commerce business. He's one of my earlier e-commerce clients, and I've uh, been working with him since 2016. When he came to um, to our business, he had uh, revenues of 1.1 million, and his operating uh, um, operating uh, I'm sorry, owner pay and profit were at 200,000. And he had been in business about three years at that point in time. In the time that we've worked with him, I just ran his numbers at the end of last year. His business now is a $3.9 million business and his owner pay and profit is uh, 700,000. And that growth was entirely without any debt. He did not, he was very, um, averse to using debt in his business. He didn't want to worry about it. And so he, he hasn't used any in his business. Now that owner pay and profit for him is the money that he has started to use in other um, ventures. He's created other businesses. He's invested in other things in addition to this business. So he's kind of diversified. Um, so once you start having that kind of cash flow going through your business, you can start to look outside the box a little bit. Um, Okay, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is seasonality. E-commerce businesses um, and, you know, even service businesses a lot of times have some type of seasonality. Um, in, I'm just going to use an e-commerce Q4 scenario because it's, it's something we can all relate to. Um, we all understand that there's a lot of purchasing that goes on around the holidays. And this past year, the, our best place to shop was online. So, um, all of our clients were building up their inventories, preparing for um, a record breaking year for sales around the, the holidays. So when they start to experience that kind of increased cash, typically our clients are seeing like a $500,000, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, a five times uh, increase in their uh, revenue during Q4. So if, if you've been humming along at a, um, at a steady state for nine months, whatever that was, you can just multiply it by five. That's what happens in Q4 with a lot of e-commerce clients. And if you use those percentages for allocation, like we talked about, you can see in that situation, a huge amount of money is going to be dumped into your OPEX account. And and quite honestly, other than spending more, more money on inventory, there's just not as much expenses on your um, uh, expenses related to your OPEX. Maybe you hire a little bit more help, but other than that, the expenses stay pretty similar. So we don't want this huge influx of money going into our OPEX account. So here's the account structure that we work with. We set up something called a drip account. So the same situation we talked about with inventory, income, inventory, um, profit, and OPEX but then we create this drip account. So when you have a month that is really extraordinary, 
what we want you to do is to put the excess in the drip account. In Q4, I, I've had clients tell me, we don't even have time to change our underwear. So it's not the time to be figuring out how much money in, is in this OPEX account that I don't really need. Just move it, put it into a, a drip account. And when the dust settles in the first part of the year, then you can look at it and say, okay, what's the best use of these funds now? If you've got debt in your business, it can be used to down... Um, to pay down some of your debt. If you are wanting to grow your inventory for this next year, you can move it to your inventory account and you're, you're set up to um, automatically increase your inventory for next year and grow your business. Um, maybe you've just worked yourself crazy and you want to hire someone. So maybe payroll is a new account that you want to create for next year. The point is you move it out of the operating expense account so that you have it available for the um, time when you can think about it, make a plan and use it to your strategic advantage. Okay, that, that's what I have for you. I just wanna remind you, if you're a product-based business, you definitely need an inventory account. If you're a service-based business, use a payroll account to keep, to keep track of your, your um, labor cost. And if you've got seasonality going on in your business, then a drip account can really help you smooth all of that out. And I thank you all for joining and Will, I'll turn it back over to you. All right, excellent stuff. Uh, real quickly, some great comments going on in the chat. Continue to uh, drop in your questions. We're going to transition over to Q and A here in just a second. But calling out Pete, right? Dimmer switch. Love the analogy. I love it too. Uh, Amity, thank you so much. Payroll for employees or contractors. This makes good sense. But most importantly, I think Mike hit it right on the nose. Ashley is walking awesome sauce. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> I think, she, Ashley, thank you so much. I think that's really, really amazing. couple of things before we start diving into the Q&A, just to resurface once again, some of the amazing stuff that's going on here. Um, order your book from Amazon. In fact, I'll post it in the Q&A uh, here if, if we can. Let's see if we can get that going. But if we can post that again in the Q&A, that would be amazing. Uh, I think I have it right here. Uh, let me do that. Yep, there you go. Uh, so order that book today, get it in your hands. Secondly, we have another uh, gift from Ashley, with the, which is the Books Keep Quick Start Guide. You'll get this in a follow-up email, but I'm just going to post it just in case. So that way you can get that as well. Incredible information for you there. Uh, um, also, uh, Mike has his uh, Profit First Overview, which I'm going to share right now in the link. Go ahead and grab that. Has some incredible structures and framework, the Profit First Formula. And then lastly, uh, Gusto, of course, uh, loves what Mike and, and Cindy does. We're going to extend out three free months on Gusto, which you can go to gsto.co forward slash profit first. So that's gsto.co forward slash profit first. I'll post it in the link. So let's turn over to Q&A and get the party started. In fact, I've already surfaced up a few questions that we can lead with. If you have more questions, continue to drop them in there and then we'll surf surface them up. Uh, at the end, but let's start with uh, Barbie real quick. How can we apply your system if it is franchise business and have a partner or multiple partners? How would you divide the profit and owner's comp? So uh, I'll leave with that one. And uh, how we do it is it may sound a little burdensome, but for clarity's sake, it is the best thing to do is to set up accounts for each individual franchise. So if you're the franchise or each franchise has its own five accounts, income, profit, and so forth. And when it comes up to dividing is what equity do you have in each business? So if I have some equity in all these locations, say I own 10% of each business, when the profit distribution comes out, I get 10% of that profit distribution and the other owners get the remaining 90%. Except for each one, I, again, I know it sounds burdensome, but it'll give you absolute clarity on how each location or each business is performing. That's superb. Uh, let me get the other question up in front of me here. We'll get cracking. Um, Guy asks, Mike, can you please repeat, what are the two accounts you recommended on bank two? Yeah. So when you're racing through and your handwriting looks like a doctor's, uh, it's very hard to discern. Believe it or not, that says profit hold is what we name it. And tax hold, these are typically savings accounts. And what we do is when we allocate money to these different accounts at bank one, we transfer from the profit account to the bank two. The idea of bank two is to have that money hidden away from you because what you don't see, you don't access. And I'll give you a little secret tip to do this. 
Um, you can ask that bank too. Don't give me online banking, starter checks, no ATM card. That's a, a great way to do it. If you're really hard pressed to make sure you don't access that account, one trick I saw one business do is the president of the company has the username and the owner of the company has the password, but neither have both. It's like turning the nuclear keys, the only way they can get into that profit account to distribute profit. Awesome. Um, Lee had a question. I've always struggled with implementing profit first. When doing the assessment, are my employees considered material and subs or are they considered operating expense? That's got Cindy's name all over it. Well, uh, Lee, if you're a, um, a um, service-based business, I personally, in my business, what I do is I use them as materials and subs. I think um, it's just easier to try to make it work if you consider your, all of your payroll um, expenses in that material and sub bucket. Now, I'm, the, the challenge and the, the downside to doing that is you don't put pressure on uh, keeping your payroll expenses low. Um, but, but like you said, you've had, you've struggled with implementing it. So making it simple and then use some other kind of metric to keep up with payroll. Like we, we use metrics around efficiency and, um, and other quality metrics to look at what's going on with our payroll. And that makes, that gives us the, the visibility and the attention into the, to our employee expenses, while keeping the profit first uh, implementation pretty straightforward. Awesome. Uh, next question is from Rachel. Thank you so much. I distribute money to my tax account, but I use it for things like sales tax, payroll tax. And I will also use that for our personal taxes, which I kind of think is, was really uh, your intended use. Is that too messy? So Rachel, messy, messy, messy. <laughs> yeah, the tax account, you're right, is intended for your personal tax liability. The one thing I would absolutely separate out is the sales tax. Um, realize and, and treat yourself like an agent for the government. Every time you sell a dollar's worth of goods, if the sales tax for your, your local sales tax is say 7%, you're collecting a dollar seven. That seven cents, you're an agent for the government. That is their money. You shouldn't even touch it. So immediately put any sales tax into an account called sales tax. In fact, Cindy and I use the term, if in doubt, add an account. So add an account called sales tax, transfer that money in there. And then the other tax account is mostly for your personal taxes, sometimes some corporate taxes too. Superb. Uh, next question is from Candice. Uh, it says, what is the difference between the profit account and the owner's comp account? Do they both end up going to the same place? Cindy, so they're going to give you that one too. It's, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh they do end up going to the same place. They do end up going to you. But the reality is you have multiple roles in your business. One role that you have is the owner of a business. The second role that you have, most of us are still working in our business as an employee. So Mike was brilliant in the way he created the, um, the percentages over time. As your business grows, your profit percentage as, um, as an owner goes up, but your owner comp percentage goes down. And the reason is because as our business grows, we're working less and less in delivering services in the business. We're spending more of our time in the owner role, you know, working on strategic things, designing the business, that kind of thing. So the owner role, as Mike mentioned, is more to reward you with a dividend, like if you had stock in a business because you have ownership in it, whereas the owner's comp is more about the service you're performing in the business, the work that you're doing in the business. So that's the reason. And, and the precaution that, that having an owner comp uh, bucket serves for you is that if for some reason you're not able to work in the business, you have the money to pay somebody else to do that. And unfortunately this year we've had situations where owners were sick and out for months with COVID related illnesses and they had to hire someone else to keep their business going. It wasn't a huge shock to them because the funds were already being set aside to pay for someone to serve in that role. Love it. Thank you so much, Mike. This one I think is for you. We love questions that make you think more dynamically. Why is profit first against borrowing money to expand business? Name me one business that can't survive without a line of credit. Uh, mine, uh, Dave Ramsey's company, six hundred million dollar business. Cindy Thomason's. Uh, I can I can actually start my business before Gusto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, yeah, right. Will your business? 
Um, but I also understand that the idea is line of credit means available cash to facilitate expansion and so forth. Using the profit first system will actually build that cash reserve internally. So you don't borrow from a third party, you use your own internal resources. But actually here's the most fascinating. Uh, and you may wanna study a case study we did about a baseball team called the Savannah Bananas, a multi-million dollar baseball team that implemented the profit first system. What Profit First does, as it starts constraining how much money is available to spend, it forces innovation. You start doing things that the industry doesn't do. You become the standout because you start breaking industry rules because you don't have the money to follow the industry norms. Savannah Bananas done, has done dozens of things that's different than the baseball industry. Now they're the fastest growing. That was the only one thing I didn't even expect. As businesses became more profitable consistently in our case studies, and we have over 3,000 now, these businesses grow faster because of forced innovation than if they were borrowing money and, and trying to grow with money alone. Mike, with if, money if alone. I could add to that, Please. one of my clients that I that I um, I shared a little bit about, he was very much against borrowing money. Um, E-commerce companies are notor notoriously involved in a lot of mastermind groups. And I would have calls with him early on and he would be like, all my friends think I'm crazy. They think I really should be investing money. <laughs> And um, I'm like, yeah, but you, you don't like that. You are concerned about that. Well, several years down the road, I ran into one of his colleagues in a mastermind group at a, at a presentation. We sat together and he said, um, oh, I know your client. And um, I said, well, I haven't talked to him in a little bit. How's he doing? He said, his biggest problem now is figuring out what to do all, with all his money. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, and he said, and in this mastermind group, those folks that relied so heavily on borrowing were stressed to the max and not able to sleep at night. And he said, it's just so much, um, so much peace of mind to know if you mess up, it's your money. You're not beholden to somebody else. Yeah. Love it. We have a few minutes left. Let's try to tackle like some power sessions here. Uh, yes, Tammy, the recording will be available afterwards. Thank you for that question. That's been a common question. Cindy, really quickly, should the payroll come out of income before the rest of the allocations or do you use a percentage for it like other allocations? I like to use a percentage because when you use a percentage, then as your, um, as your business grows, you can start to build up that payroll account. Now, again, you need metrics to be sure you're using your labor efficiently, but as you build up that payroll account, when you need to add capacity to your organization, then you've got funds set aside for that next hire and you're, you're not wondering if you can afford to hire someone. Love it. Lee asks, is there a reason you shouldn't move money from your uh, money, your money from income straight to your tax account at a different bank? Why would you suggest two tax accounts? Yeah, so this is a little behavioral trick, Lee. Um, you can technically move it straight, but the problem with transfers from one bank to the other is they take time. Sometimes it can be a few days. If there's a holiday or weekend, it can even take four or five days for the transfer to invoke. That means every time you log into your bank account and people are logging in daily, hourly, some people said, you're seeing that money sitting there and it confuses us. You can instantly transfer money within a bank and see what its intended use is. So it allows it to go in an envelope so you know its intended use. It sits there and then transfers out. Lovely. We have two minutes left. And I want to make sure we end on time, but maybe uh, Mike, Cindy, as uh, close us out with some words of encouragement, uh, maybe inspiration, any additional thoughts that you'd like to, to provide everyone? Yeah, I'll share some, some final words is uh, the importance of your success. Uh, you, a small business owner, I will tell you with this COVID pandemic, there is a tsunami of shift going on, a tsunami of change going on. And it's, uh, it's to a level I don't think we can even see. The large companies, if this is like a tsunami going through an ocean, large companies are in tanker ships. They're going to try to roll over all this change that's afoot. Small businesses, us, we're on jet skis. The opportunity is ours. We can shift and adjust and cater to our market in a new way and ride this wave to great success. I actually am convinced the next mega companies five years from now are probably in this room right now. It's, it's small business. But the only way to get there is through financial viability. You must be profitable. Clients are starving for it. Get up on that wave, ride it all the way. We need your success. It, it's hard to follow Mike, but I will tell you in uh, March and April, when 
everything was going on with COVID, I got two kinds of emails. I got emails from clients that didn't know what they were going to do. Amazon was shutting down, restricting how much that could be sent in. They just were panicking. And we went into crisis management, doing uh, cash flow planning, 13 week cash flow planning with them to see how we could keep them afloat. The other email I got was from folks saying, thank you so much for getting us on profit first. It, we are we are poised to to weather this. We know we're going to be fine. I can tell you, as a result of going through that, I want all my clients now on profit first. I didn't like the first email; it made our life crazy. So it, it really does set you up to um, to go to weather the storms, and there'll be another one. There always is. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Mike, for your time and Cindy for your professionalism and expertise. Um, I'm Will Lopez. Thank you for your time, most importantly. And uh, feel free to check out the resources in the chat. There'll be a follow-up email from, from all of us to grab those additional resources. Head over to Amazon, pick up the Profit First book. I'm Will with Gusto. Go with Gusto, Mike at Profit First, and Cindy with Bookskeep. Take care. <laughs>